Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. St. Lucia's former cultural attaché to Martinique, Shazi Shalom, is calling for the neighboring island to be considered as an addition to the travel bubble. Shalom notes various benefits of short-term travel between St. Lucia and Martinique and believes that the removal of mandatory quarantine when traveling between the two islands could greatly benefit both economies. With the advent of the travel bubble, islands within CARICOM have eased travel restrictions for persons moving between the member states, including the removal of mandatory quarantine. This has arguably made travel more appealing to people in the region as compared to destinations where quarantine is still mandatory. Former cultural attaché Shazi Shalo believes that such an arrangement ought to be considered as travel resumes between St. Lucia and Martinique. Shalo says the neighboring island of Martinique has proven to be a strong partner for trade and tourism. He believes that the inclusion of Martinique as a safe destination under travel bubble protocols will stimulate the economies of both territories. If you really want to stimulate the economy, to me is the best way to go, to open up to that um, 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 economy. Because don't forget also, Martinique is our number one regional market. And the, the, the money spent by those people, they, for example, they go to the small uh, Airbnbs, right? Small hotels and so on. They frequent our local restaurants and local boutiques and so on. And I'm sure Hobby must be crying all now as well. Um, so that I'm saying, so that money spread more in the economy and the ordinary man gets a piece of that pie. If you're talking about an economic stimulus, to me, that is the way to go. Shalo further calls for a review of the operations at state-funded quarantine facilities in St. Lucia. He says during his time in quarantine, after returning to St. Lucia from a trip to Martinique, he noted various areas of inefficiency, which may be leading to the high cost of operations reported by state officials. There's no cohesiveness also as far as the protocol is concerned. Because what I was seeing as, as if like, Things were being made up along the way, you know? I mean, for instance, I was there probably eight or nine days before I was tested, you know what I'm saying? To be if somebody comes in, they should be tested immediately, you know what I'm saying? Or within three or four days for that matter, you know what I'm saying? Because as soon as they got my results and they realized that I was COVID free, they released me, you know what I'm saying? So somebody could go, for example, go home and continue um, do probably four or five days or six days in the quarantine and continue the quarantine at home, you know what I'm saying? Which would be more comfortable to, to, to the person and more co um, cost effective to the government as well. Under current travel protocols between St. Lucia and Martinique, travelers must undergo mandatory quarantine upon arrival at both islands. This protocol governs both air and sea travel, with local ferry operators still unable to resume operations due to low demand. Jaco Wooding, Hot 7 News. On the eve of Emancipation Day, Jamaica's Supreme Court ruled that the constitutional rights of a five-year-old girl were not breached in 2018 when she was denied access to the Kensington Primary School, a prestigious public school in St. Catherine, because of her dreadlocked hair. Public Relations Officer of St. Lucia's Ionola Council for the Advancement of Rastafari, Ica, Emerson Nurse, says the organization joins human rights activists around the world in signaling its disappointment on this motion. Jamaica's High Court has ruled that a school was within its rights to demand that a girl cut her dreadlocks in order to attend class. The ruling was the final judgment of a two-year battle after the girl, who was then five years old, was told that she must cut her dreadlocks for hygiene purposes in order to be permitted to study at the Kensington Primary School. The court's ruling in favor of the school was a surprise decision, which according to the Ayanola Council for the Advancement of Rastafari, has touched on the issues of identity and one of the most recognizable symbols of the Rastafarian culture. Aika shares the disappointment together with human rights advocates over the news coming out of Jamaica on the eve of Emancipation Day, where a five-year-old school, where a five-year-old girl was forced out of primary school for wearing dreadlocks according to a Rastafarian upbringing. It is a cause for dismay, especially in the wake of current circumstances surrounding the ongoing struggle towards equality and liberation for all across the planet. Jamaican activist Crystal Tomlinson has lent support to the family. 
saying that the order for the girl to cut her dreadlocks amounted to a denial of her freedom of expression and her access to education. She believes that the court battle has ruled in favor of discrimination against people who choose to wear natural hairstyles. Of personal expression, to which all of us have a constitutional right, and so long as that exercise of the right is not infringing on anybody else's rights, then you should, for all intents and purposes, be able to express yourself. And for the family, they express themselves with their hair. Yeah, some of us express ourselves with piercings, some of us express ourselves with tattoos, some of us express ourselves in the way we dress, the way we speak. They chose hair. And this little girl, you should see the photos, they are so cute. Her hair is so neat, right? And they saw her hair as an offense to good hygiene. Some schools, including Kensington Primary, explicitly state that dreadlocks are not allowed, and other schools have banned students who refuse to cut them. In the wake of this challenge, the Ministry of Education in Jamaica has issued guidelines for hairstyles, including a directive that if a child were to wear dreadlocks, they must be neat. Jaco Wooding, Hot 7 News. Speaking at a police press conference on Friday, Acting Police Commissioner Milton Daisy informed that police will continue working in tandem with the Ministry of Health to ensure all COVID-19 health and safety protocols are adhered to. Daisy indicated that public service providers such as taxi drivers run the risk of having their COVID-19 certification and permits withdrawn if they defy the rules. The Royal St. Lucia Police Force is reaffirming its position when it comes to enforcing the health and safety laws issued by the Office of the Chief Medical Officer. On Friday, Acting Police Commissioner Milton Daisy issued a warning to taxi drivers letting them know that there are penalties for those who defy the measures set out for them. We also have complaints of taxi drivers who do not adhere to the protocol set about by them. I know that the team, the health team, tourism, they went about, persons who were trained and so on, but they are forgetting the training that they received. Um, I was just informed that persons, their, their permits would be taken from there. That is the approval. Not all taxis were approved to, to be transporting persons, but with put protocols, those who met it and so on. So these permits may be withdrawn if um, they are not adhering to the protocol. He also explained to members of the public that they too should be adhering to the protocol set for their safety and indicated that the laws for public transportation have not changed and should not be flouted. We have, um, for example, the buses. We know that certain protocols upon reopening the system, certain health protocols were put in place where there would be a number of persons on a bus. It was identified persons would need to wear their mask while traveling on a bus. There have been um, the contention that if you are on a vehicle, it is not public, but um, the law require you to wear a mask in public and let me inform persons that a public transport system as the word detect, you are in public. You are in public space when you are on a bus. You must wear your mask when you are on a public service vehicle. Daisy says police officers will continue to be vigilant and reminds the public that attached to the infringement of these laws is a fine of $1,000 or six months in jail. He says people need to comply with the rules as they are all there in an effort to ensure the spread of COVID-19 is limited in St. Lucia. Reporting for Hot 7 News, I am Janine Conrad. Thank you, Janine. Five months after a general election, the opposition candidate Irfan Ali has been sworn in as Guyana's president. Following allegations of vote tampering, a recount and a lengthy legal battle, the election commission declared Ali the winner on Sunday and he was sworn in hours later. Veteran journalist Earl Buske has aired his views on the conclusion of the lengthy election. The discovery of huge oil reserves in Guyanese waters over the past years and projections for the country's wealth to grow exponentially garnered much attention to the 2020 general election. Attention that was rightly directed, according to veteran journalist Ul Buske. Guyana having established the record as a country of the longest vote count in the history of mankind, having taken five months to count less than half a million votes, 
um, we would hope that the next record that Guyana um, establishes is one in which it can show our country that is earning money from vast oil earnings as the country which will be the richest in CARICOM and in the world by virtue of the earnings from oil per head of population. Busque says the oil discovery could put Guyana among the world's top economies in a few years, but this would greatly depend on the government overseeing the oil industry. We could only hope that the new administration will be able to not only realize the dreams of Guyanese, but to do so in a way that spreads across the political, racial, cultural spectrum uh, in Guyana and ensures that like in the period when Chedi Jagan and Forbes Burnham led the PPP before external intervention to create the divisions that are dividing Guyana today, let's hope uh, that the new PPP administration will be able to bring again to the fore the sort of creation of a big PPP tent that is going to gather under it all of the people of Guyana. The election was on March 2, 2020, and pitted 75-year-old David Granga of the People's National Congress against 40-year-old Ufan Ali of the People's Progressive Party. Granga declared victory days after the vote, but international electoral observers said that counting in Guyana's most populous electoral district, Region 4, had been interrupted and was incomplete. The opposition alleged that the result in Region 4 had been in Granga's favor. However, Guyana's Supreme Court, though it initially ordered a partial recount, ruled that a full recount should be held. Primary data suggested that the opposition had won the election, but the Guyana Elections Commission did not declare Ali as the winner until Sunday, August 2nd. Jaka Wooding, Hot 7 News. This is the Hot 7 TV Nightly News. Stay with us. There's more news coming up after the break.